Right, I hope you all uh, had your lunch and everything and feeling uh, raring to go. Um, so I will introduce our next speaker. Um, okay, so David Wood <clears throat> is chair of the London Futurists. He spent 25 years envisioning archi uh, architecting, implementing, supporting, and avidly using smart mobile devices, including 10 years with PDA manufacturers, uh, Scion P PLC, and then more with smartphone operating system, smartphone operating system uh, specialist Symbian. His background includes many years building and integrating UI system software and application frameworks and uh, directing technical consulting teams uh, with the lead mobile manufacturer, phone mobile manufacturers in the world to create the first successful smartphones that you all have in your pocket. Um, or hopefully. Uh, in 2009, he was included in the T3's list of 100 most influential people in technology. Um, and uh, he's also executive director of Transpolitica, an activist think tank founded in January 2015 to accelerate the adoption of the better politics of tomorrow. So please welcome to the stage, David Wood. So didn't we have uh, three very good talks this morning? I mean, I was personally familiar with all these subject areas, having been at a few Zeitgeist events before, but I thought these three talks this morning put things particularly clearly, particularly vividly. So I've got lots of new reading to follow up on from that. And these three speakers all looked at key problems in our present day, issues that are demanding answers. I'm gonna look at a different kind of problem. It's related, as we'll see, but it's a problem which is gonna be brought about by the rapid progress in technology and how it's going to change the nature of work, the nature of employment. And don't laugh, I've given it the title Anticipating the Rise of Robots, or well, there's a more technical term for it, technological unemployment. And today this is a bit of an issue, and as I'm going to explain, it's going to become more and more of an issue that's going to require the same kind of zeitgeist change to address it that we've heard about in the morning. And although I've called it a problem, it is also an opportunity, as I'll describe. So to start off with, let's remind ourselves of something of the relentless pace of change over just the last 10 years in terms of what's happened in the world of computing alone. You may have heard there's something called Moore's Law, which summarized, we can say that over the course of 10 years, computers get 125 times more powerful over the course of 10 years for the same price, for the same size. Or you can do it differently. You can use this, uh, this uh, improvement in computing technology to get a single computer which runs five times faster than before, but was also five times cheaper than before. So if it cost you 100 pounds 10 years ago, it'll be down to 20 pounds today, and go five times faster, and also be five times smaller, which means it'll take a lot less battery power. And also, computing can store more information. And then there are improvements to networks. You've heard of 3G and 4G and 5G. There are better Wi-Fi networks the whole time, so data can be shared more. So it's not surprising that many things have changed in our personal computing in the last 10 years. Many things we now take for granted, but which 10 years ago, almost none of us were thinking about or using. Things like electronic books. Amazon announced just a few years ago that they were now selling more electronic books than physical books onto Kindles and other devices. And then there are tablets. Tablets which uh, have been taking over the world, 100 million of them were sold in just a few years, changing the lives of grandparents, grandchildren, many professions, and many other people. We've seen the growth of smartphones so that many people around the world, even people in comparatively poor uh, environments, uh, in third world countries are having their livelihoods changed and enhanced by these devices. And then there are applications. There's something called Facebook. Ten years ago, you needed to be a student at a few universities in North America to have a Facebook account. Now, probably most of us love and hate our Facebook account. Many of us uh, spend a great deal of time with it, can hardly remember what it was like before. And then there's Twitter, which is also less than 10 years old. And by the way, we do have a 
hashtag for this conference today. It's hashtag ZDAYUK15. So if you're getting bored with what I'm saying, then by all means, have a quick look at what others are saying about this conference on ZDAYUK15. But I'll try and keep your attention here. Even more remarkable, I think, is the fact that 10 years ago, there was almost nothing on YouTube. I think there was about one video that had been uploaded just 10 years ago. But now we take it for granted that we can uh, send uh, wonderful pictures of uh, cats to each other all the time. <laughs> and in case that's flippant, let's also remember what else YouTube has given us. Things like Khan Academy, a tremendous uh, free resource of wonderful educational material accessible by all, so that even the richest person in the world, Bill Gates, has his own children doing lessons on Khan Academy. Not because they're free, but because they're just so good. And of course, Bill Gates uh, puts a lot of his own personal money into the Khan Academy. And then there's things like Wikipedia, which 10 years ago had a few hundred articles in it, but since that time has become a tremendous resource for figuring out, in many cases, what's true and what's reliable. Zooming out a bit more, if we go back 20 years ago, here's the kind of stuff that a guy called Barry Ritz-Coltz, a uh, United States blogger, was using in his daily life. And there's a bit of an exaggeration, but not much of an exaggeration. He says this is what he used 20 years later instead of all that stuff. Just one device. So he no longer needs to carry that heavy camcorder around, that separate Polaroid camera, a Sony Walkman, a Palm Pilot, and so forth. And as I said, it's an exaggeration, but it shows what remarkable changes have been happening. And there are remarkable changes in other fields too. Just very quickly, some of you may recognize this uh, city. This is from just over 20 years ago. If you look closely, you might see some Chinese writing there. This is the Shanghai famous Bund uh, waterway. And uh, 20 years later, it looked like this. So it is remarkable what we humans can do if we put our minds to it. Just imagine if we put our minds to more constructive tasks. And of course, the Chinese can do this even more quickly now. They can build one of these skyscrapers in a fraction of the time. Now, there's one view that says, yes, we've had remarkable change in the past, but it's sort of coming to an end. All the big things that need to have happened have happened. And here I'm quoting a view described by Kevin Kelly, who is a very wise writer on technology, the co-founder of Wired, as some of you may read from time to time. And Kevin Kelly refutes this view. He says, relatively speaking, nothing big has happened yet. We're not even at the beginning of the changes that technology is going to bring us. We're just at the beginning of the beginning of all these kinds of changes. And he says that the next 20 years are going to make the last 20 years just pale in comparison. So if you think there's been a lot of change in the past, you can expect a lot more. And that's a view I certainly share too. And I'll discuss this abstractly for a bit, and then I'll move in and try and make it more vivid and more realistic. In a big abstract sense, what we're going to see in the next 10 to 20 years is something called NBIC convergence. This is not a Canadian radio station. It stands for nanotech, information computer technology, biotech, and cognotech. The stuff I've been talking about already is all in this corner down here, the bits, mainly, when we can store things much more cheaply, we can compute things much more cheaply, we can transmit things much more cheaply. But there's four other corners to this remarkable transformation. Nanotech is about manipulating things at the atomic level. We can see a bit of this in 3D printing when we're able to create things in more wonderful ways than before, but increasingly we're able to create bots, nanobots, which are computers at the molecular level. Biotech means we're able to improve our genes Scary stuff, lots of potential for things going wrong, lots of issues there, but if we do it right, we can become much healthier, much stronger than before. I just saw today that a super drug may not be your favorite store, they do lots of good things, they are now offering uh, the 23andMe genetic personal kit for you to buy and apply in your own home to find out more about your own genes, which may be a good thing, may be a bad thing, but the change is coming. The last quadrant here is the quadrant of cognotech. We are understanding the brain cells and the neurons and what's going on in our minds much more fully than before. And roughly speaking, what's on the left side of this big diagram is stuff in the physical world. The right side is biology. 
Roughly speaking, the top half is hardware and the bottom half is software. But the real change will come from the connections between all these different areas. Their eyes, we're getting better and better at computing. We can actually design physical things more clearly, such as 3D printing, as I said. Hence, you may have heard the strange phrase that nowadays hardware is becoming software. That many of the remarkable changes which have taken place in the world of digitized information will take place in many of the other manufacturing goods too. We can also have sensors which are smaller and smaller. We can put them on the body or inside the brain. We can understand what's happening in the brain more fully. And once we understand how the brain does its remarkable tricks, we can then improve our own software. And so on it goes. So that's fairly abstract. Let's make it a bit more concrete in terms of four big stories I think we're going to be reading in the magazines and online over the next 10 years or so. They're already here. Four great convergences. The first convergence is between human and machine. We've had computing devices on our desks and on our laps. We've had them now in our pockets. We are increasingly wearing them on our wrists, in our clothing. We will have them, I believe strongly, we will have them in glasses some stage in the next five to 10 years, which will be extremely powerful. And then they'll go inside our body. They'll get smaller. And we're already putting some things inside our body. My mother has put a new hip, uh, courtesy of the NHS, inside her body, transformed her life. And more recently, she's had a new lens, solving some cataract issues in her eyes. Both cases, she was fearful, but now she's very grateful. That's just the beginning of the changes we're going to have. So increasingly, we are going to become not the $6 billion man, because that's far too expensive, but as this technology becomes cheaper and more accessible, we are cyborgs with computing inside our bodies and outside. The second great convergence is when we apply more of our software skills into the world of biology. And instead of just coding in the world of silicon semiconductors, we will be doing coding in the natural language, the natural computing language of DNA. So we will be creating, in some cases, improved life forms, which can do remarkable things, hopefully, like taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, can be improving uh, the waste and reworking the waste that we generate. And we can also have genetic engineering, not just for the, the scary story of designer babies, but also for the more interesting story in many ways of redesigning ourselves. So if we are aware from 23 and me or other things that we have some particular limitations in our biology, that can be fixed. It's a big story. Let's not go down there today. Let's move on. Third big convergence is between the physical world and the virtual world. You're all here today watching it in the physical world. But in the future, more and more people will be watching these events virtually too in real time. People will be watching from their home, from all around the world. And they will be living in helmets, which makes them think that they are here. And we will imagine that they are here too. This is the transition from virtual reality to augmented reality. We will have these helmets. We will have glasses, which will give us more and more useful information as we're walking around, helping us to enjoy our lives better, to understand what we're doing. And there are other things we could talk about, like the massive online open courses, which are often free, which give us the information, like Khan Academy and many other courses, which is transforming education. Everybody complains that education is very expensive these days, $6,000, 9,000 pounds, sorry. In the future, it'll be much, much less because we'll get much of the learning from these online courses. The convergence I most want to talk about, the one that's going to bring it back to the main topic of today, is the convergence between artificial intelligence, what computers can do, and the kind of intelligence that goes on in our heads, human intelligence. And my story is, and what we're going to see increasingly over the next 10 years, is more and more capacity of these machines, robots, software, call them what you like, to do deep machine learning, to figure out by themselves what's going on in their environment, and to guide us and to take decisions for us or to suggest decisions for us. I'll give examples. And the way forward here is that we can adopt some kind of hybrid intelligence in which we use our own native wit but supplement it by the intelligence that this new technology will provide. The even more scary thing is what happens in that middle there when all four convergences are themselves converging. But let's leave that for another day. I just want to pull back a bit and say 
There is strong evidence, in my view, that technology is accelerating through positive feedback. More and more people are learning about technology and universities at homes all throughout the world. More and more people are taking up some of these things in hacking formats or as part-time or as a second or third career. And more and more people are building on top of each other's insights. And so I think it's fairly likely that in the course of these next 10 to 20 years, we will have increasingly enhanced humans with extra intelligence, extra health, extra longevity, extra experiences, and to sum it up, with extra opportunities. But I imagine many of you have got lots of question marks in your mind too. You're probably thinking, well, hang on, there's another consequence to all this technology, which we can sum up as it's disturbing humanity. Because there are many things that can go wrong with all this extra firepower that we are putting at our own disposal. And you can look at it from different angles. You can say, well, there are already some really angry and alienated and frustrated people in this world, uh, young people, middle-aged people in various terrorist groups or various militaries. If they get a hand of some of this technology, it could be even worse than what's already happening. And then there are governments, some more benign governments, some very terrible governments who can use this stuff, uh, surveillance of one sort or another. And then there's what we're doing to the environment and the issues on the climate, which I think are really the big existential question of our time. Then there's the risk that as we put more intelligence into robots of various kinds, they're going to unintentionally do things that we programmed in but which we didn't foresee, whether it's battlefield robots running amok with various drones making their own decisions which come back to haunt us, whether it's uh, financial robots who are meant to be supervising the stock exchange and crash it and burn it, then we have a much worse problem than happened in the past. Well, we'll come back to that. But to summarize that, there is existential risks from this growth in technology too. In other words, this positive accelerating technology cycle will benefit individuals. It's got a strong possibility to do that. At the same time, it is threatening society. And my big question is why aren't more people talking about this? If I look at what the politicians are talking about in the run-up to the general election, I see almost nobody raising these issues. It's a real issue of people being trapped in their own inertia, their own momentum, their own uh, vested interests. Well, very glad to hear, see that people in this conference are tackling some of the more fundamental issues. Some reaction to this is to say, oh, it's not going to happen. Technology is going to run out of steam. We've, we have had all that, uh, the benefits that uh, are going to come. I think that's wrong. You know, you look around, you can see so much evidence of uh, incredible technology innovation. So I don't think it's possible that technology is going to stop all by itself. Other people say, well, hang on, we'll just switch the switch off. You know, we're going to stop people developing technology. That's how we're going to avoid these problems. But I don't think that's going to happen either because there's so many vested interests who are benefiting. And, and, and we, actually, are benefiting in many ways from these enhancements, whether it's better hips, better uh, lenses in our eyes, and, and all these other stuff. I think there are, however, two credible scenarios that people can take regarding this uh, stark issues facing us. And one of these viewpoints is quite common in Silicon Valley. It's quite common in a lot of big industrialists. It's quite common in a lot of startups. And they say, let's just focus on allowing individuals to enhance themselves. Let's not stop these technological companies. Let's encourage more smart research and development. Let's uh, have free enterprise do whatever it needs to do. Let's keep the government out of the way because the government are clumsy. The government don't understand new technology. The government regulators are always solving yesterday's problems instead of tomorrow's problems. Get them out of the way, and we will improve humans. And they say, somewhat naively, in my view, they say the world's social problems will be solved as a byproduct. For example, this new technology will uh, be able to suck the CO2 out of the environment. This new technology will have better solar uh, conductors than ever before, better energy storage than ever before. And so that's how we'll solve some of the issues of climate change. This view has got a name called techno-libertarians. They love technology and they say, just let us free to, to progress as we wish. As I've said, I think this is a naive view. It's a politically naive view. It doesn't recognize that there are many issues that will not be solved just by technology alone. That we do need, it's well as this research and development, 
We also need wise regulation, not to stop this, but to steer it, and smart governance. And although government hasn't made a great job in the past of doing it, we who under, do understand these technological issues, the benefits and the risks, must get more involved. And more than that, to change the social systems. So this viewpoint is called techno-progressives, and I'm very happy to label myself as a techno-progressive, even though I think there's a lot of smart and clever and well-meaning people on the other side of that dimension. Now, you may be thinking of all these existential risks. One of them doesn't really belong there. You may say robot uprising, that's a bit of a kind of a Hollywood scenario, isn't it? So that's what I want to talk to you about next. I want to convince you that this actually is something that we should be considering on roughly the same level as all these other issues down there. And I'm going to show you four people who should be fearing the robot uprising. Number one, there's the elevator operator. When he used to be employed to go in and they, uh, take people up the lift and down the lift. When I was young, I remember seeing these guys in various uh, department stores. They've all gone now because, what? Uh, lifts can operate themselves. It's not a very clever robot, but it, uh, the user comes in and presses a few buttons, and you don't need a, a, a human operator to solve it. Number two, the bank teller. Uh, you still occasionally can get money from a human being at the bank, but much more often you go and interact with a robot. It's called an ATM, a hole in the wall. Number three, this guy's looking a bit concerned in there. I think he should be. He is the till operator, is increasingly going to be put out of work by another kind of robot, the checkout. And they're not very good yet. You know, you can uh, sort of get by these checkout tills if you're a bit patient. And often you need a human to come and sort you out. But guess what? They're going to get better. They're going to get 125 times better over 10 years, which is probably going to be a lot better than most of the checkout assistants. Number four I've got down there is the passport checker. This angry passport checker is, in many cases, going to be replaced by iris checkers and fingerprint checkers, and occasionally there'll be an interrogation that you need. So all of these people either have been put out of work or will be put out of work by robot uprising. A whole class of people. This is what used to happen in many companies when I did my internship in a company in Edinburgh in, goodness, 1977, there's a whole bunch of people that looked a bit like this, the typing pool, and they've all been put out of work by Microsoft Office and uh, other software. So they've all gone too. So we're talking now about this technological unemployment. And I can summarize what's going on here by this uh, Dilbert cartoon, in which Dilbert's boss wants to get the admin organizer, Carol, wants her to organize a meeting. So Dilbert's boss strides up to Carol and says, schedule a meeting with Dilbert and Alice for next Tuesday at 10. And before the Carol can waken up, Dilbert's phone says, done. Oh, never mind, my phone has taken care of it. And by this time, Carol has woken up and is getting a bit worried. What's she going to be doing with the rest of her life? <laughs> Admin staff out of a job. And you may have ideas, you may tell her to go and retrain become a software engineer or a, a taxi driver or whatever, but we'll get to that in a minute. Then there's all the people who are driving cars. And there's a self-driving car, which for many years people said was an impossibility. There were lots of papers written about how computers would never be fast enough to make sense of who's crossing the street. Is that a pedestrian coming into the street that you need to slow down for or whatever? And initially, cars were terrible, and they would soon stop. They would get stuck in bends. But for the last 10 years, they've been improving remarkably. And they're going to be much safer than human drivers, which is why increasingly we're going to say, let's have uh, computers driving these instead of the, the kind of uh, distracted uh, drivers. But what's going to happen then to all the taxi drivers? What's going to happen to all the lorry drivers who spend all the time driving uh, freight up and down? Now, you may think it's... Uh, bad use of the environment to have all that freight being driven anyway. But let's see, there are many people whose livelihood comes from driving today. And if you think about it further, there's probably lots of other people going to be made uh, unemployed because of this, like the insurance salespeople. I'll insure you in case you have a crash when you're driving. Well, no, thank you. I won't have a crash when I'm driving. I'm not driving anymore. And then there are managers. And this is an article from the Harvard Business Review from a couple of days ago. Uh, from the Institute for the Future. And they say, you know, fi Fortune 5000, Fortune 500 in executives spend a fair amount of time thinking about how automation and the internet are changing the nature of employment. Maybe they don't need admin staff anymore. 
Well, guess what? They rarely wonder about how technology will have an impact much closer to the home on their own jobs. And the people at the Institute for the Future, they wrote this article, here's how managers can be replaced by software. And there's a demo app called iCEO. I think it does more of a project management role than a CEO's role, to be frank. But if you look inside what it does, uh, you wouldn't want to change this straight away. You'd want to test it out. But they have been testing it out in their own use for reports that they are writing inside their own institute. And they are finding that they can use software to manage that whole process much more. What about real specialist jobs, like the jobs of doctors? Well, this guy here, Vinod Kosla, is a leading uh, VC in Silicon Valley, has said, in his view, that by 10 years' time, 80% of the functions that doctors do will be done much better and much more cheaply by machines and algorithms. So there still will be some work for doctors to do, but they probably won't get anything like the same salaries as before. And what's going on here? Let's step back and look at the technology that's making all these uh, changes possible. The first is the ability to understand natural language. Because in order to be a doctor, you've got to understand what people are saying. You need to understand what's written down. And today, if you talk to your phone, sometimes it understands you, and a lot of the time it doesn't. And it's a bit of a game. But you know, it is getting better and better. And there is this software by IBM, which they called Watson, which they developed to understand natural language. They developed it to play in an American quiz show called Jeopardy, which is very popular there, which involves very cryptic clues. It's like doing the, the worst and most difficult cryptic crossword, and you need an awful lot of background information to be able to jump to the conclusions. Well, they fed Watson the entire uh, works of William Shakespeare. They fed it all of Wikipedia. They fed it the King James Bible. They fed it the IMDB database. They even fed it a book that one of these two other people had written. One of them is called Michael Jennings, who is one of the best Jeopardy players ever. He wrote a book called How to Win at Jeopardy, and they let uh, Watson read that too. And it turns out that uh, this uh, Watson did in 2011 have a better reaction in real time. It was disconnected from the internet, but it was listening to the questions, and it was buzzing in to say, I know the answer to that. And it got some of them wrong, but it got more of them right than humans. And some people say, oh, it's just a game. There's nothing serious here. Well, what IBM are doing next is even more significant. They are using the same software in an, an advisory role for doctors. They are developing Do Watson MD, which has the ability to read medical records. And some medical records are in a fixed format, but many things in a medical record are just doctors writing down string, streams of notes. So increasingly, Watson can read that. Watson can read all the medical research publications, no human doctor can hope to keep up with all the publications that are written. So Watson's keeping its eye on that. And Watson can clone itself and can share its own findings that puts it ahead of the humans as well. It's able to discern off in new patterns. It's able to suggest new experiments. So when a patient presents him or herself with various uh, uh, symptoms, Watson's sometimes able to say, I'm not sure what's going on here, but you could try doing this test now. And the doctors are able to ask it, why do you think that? And Watson's able to explain its reasoning. And occasionally the doctors say, oh, no, 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 you misunderstand this. It can't happen. And then it learns. And it learns. And all the different Watsons share amongst themselves what they're learning. And so it's not good enough today to replace much of what doctors do. But within 10 years, we're going to see medical science transformed. And we're going to see many work that doctors do transformed. Then there's creative work. And some people say, oh, I don't need to worry about this. You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm a creative person. You know, I'm going to do very emotionally intelligent stuff. I'm going to be a musician. Well, there are now computers that can write music in the style of Bach, which uh, other classical music experts can't distinguish. They don't know whether that's being written by a computer or whether it's a less well-known piece by Bach himself, and so on for many other a musical a superstars. I haven't yet seen the number one record in the hit parade chart being written by an AI, but I don't think it's going to be far away. So there's a bunch of creativity going on there too. So to summarize, what's driving the growth of technological unemployment is a whole series of new technological skills. There's the understanding of natural language. There's the improvements in reasoning, expert systems, where it's understanding medical connections and so forth. There's deep learning, which is spotting patterns in data. 
We're watching, and it's associated computers have already spotted new ways to make sense out of uh, biopsy data. And for looking at uh, whether somebody's a uh, tumor in a breast, whether it's likely to be malignant or benign. There's been a five or six tests that have been applied since, what, the 1930s. Well, Watson and its associations were able to say, look, there's actually another few tests you should be doing, looking at the tissue alongside as well. So it's already spotting new patterns. What we're going to see next is deep learning plus plus, which not only do they spot new patterns, they spot new ways in which they can learn, which is something we humans are still very good at. We're often confused for a while, then we figure it out. We say, I know how I can learn in this situation. Well, increasingly, AI is going to do that too. With artificial creativity, with artificial emotion, it's going to display emotion on its face, which we're going to take as being emotional, and it's also going to be very good. It is already very good in many ways at detecting our emotions. So there's already some software that you can detect whether people are relaxed or nervous just by looking at their face. Then there's movement. Some people say, oh, we don't need to worry about robot uprising. All we need to do is climb upstairs. Robots will never be able to climb upstairs. And today, they're not very good at it. But you know what? They're going to get better. And we could look at some of the videos of Big Dog you know, by Boston Dynamics, now bought by Google. Remarkable uh, imagery of robots being able to uh, step around. They're still not very good. The stuff that the robots are trying to do in the Fukushima uh, disaster zone, they're trying to go in and clean up. They're not able to do that yet. But I think in a few years' time, they're going to be better at it. And one reason they're going to be better at it, there's one missing skill here, which is going to make a whole lot of this stuff go much faster. That is the missing skill of computer vision, which means understanding what's in the environment. It's because the computers often don't know what's in the environment. The cars, they're not actually looking at it in the same way that we are. They've got lots of kind of radar around, or a LIDAR, it's called. They don't have many normal cameras to figure out what's going on. It's because computer vision still hasn't been very good. But I do want to spend just a moment telling you about some of the remarkable improvements in computer vision over the last few years. And I'll refer to a big database. There's something called the ImageNet database, which computer scientists have assembled and used. It's got 14 million images. And here's one. And you can see in here the computer has first figured out there's a bird there. And then it's sort of there's something else in there. And it's looked and said, oh, that's a frog. And here's another one. It's looked and said, oh, there's a person. Maybe it should have said it's a man, I don't know. And then it said in one hand it's got a hammer. And on the other hand, it's got a white box. It knows there's something there, it doesn't know what it is. So it's left that bit blank. It hasn't been able to figure that out. And I'm not sure I could figure it out either. Maybe it's a nail of some sort. And it's also spotted a flower pot, which I didn't see in the picture at first. If you crane your eyes, you can see a flower pot and a power drill. So there are 14 million images like this in the database. And they've been classified by humans. Poor, jo poor job, they've gone through it very carefully and uh, they've said well, about a thousand different things are in these pictures. And this is used every year in a big test. So you may have heard of various grand challenges like the grand challenge DARPA used to use to figure out which uh, self-driving cars were best. Well, every year now there's a large-scale visual recognition challenge. When they issue uh, uh, about a thousand of these pictures, they allow the computers to train on it and then they give it others and see how accurate or inaccurate they are. And last year, Last year, the winning software only made 6.6% errors. It was able to recognize correctly most of the stuff it saw in there, which was a big improvement from the year before, down from 11.7% errors to 6.6. And in fact, over the four years this competition has been running, there's been a fourfold improvement. Because all these guys go back, they're working on their algorithms, they're learning how humans do it. Still not quite as good as humans, because when Poor humans are asked to do the same thing, not the original humans who did the classification, but others are brought in. They generally get, still make some mistakes. They get about 95% wrong and 5%, 95% right, 5% wrong. But soon we might imagine the computers are going to do it better. And late breaking news, in February last year, a team from Microsoft Beijing, led by this guy, Jan Sung, they did it outside the normal competition cycle, but they are saying they've already got it down to 4.94% error rate. And so I think in 10 years' time, uh, these uh, systems, they're going to be much cheaper, they're going to be much smaller, they are going to be telling uh, robots all kinds of things about their environment. And this is key to robots being able to do lots more human tasks. So time to start summarizing. The challenges ahead, and there are kind of three big challenges ahead, three big questions that's probably in your mind by this stage. The first is, okay, we might 
be put out of our present job. You know, we might have been a checkout assistant. Maybe we can't do that job anymore. But can't we retrain? You know, can't we go and learn something new? After all, this has happened in the past. After all, two, 200 years ago in this country, there were many people complaining about the growth of automated weaving. There was the Luddites who complained about it and said it's putting them out of jobs. And they managed in the end to get new jobs. Maybe not them, but their children got new jobs in other kinds of factories. Eventually, some of them became software engineers. Eventually, some of them became stylish hairdressers and so on. So can't people retrain? Won't there be new jobs? And I think, yes, today, Many humans are able to retrain, but you know what? As robots are getting better and better, as that pace of improvement gets faster, I think that in some relatively near time, perhaps 10 years, perhaps 15 years, perhaps 20 years, most people, if they try and retrain, if they take two years out to learn a new skill, they will find that in the meantime, robots have got better than them. So they thought they were gonna do a new job, but robots have got better than them faster. So that's why this is gonna be different from all the previous times in history. That's why there's more of a threat here. And I think this will still be a some number of human jobs, but probably not very many. Because some people say, all right, I'm being put out of work by some software, but you know, I can go and become a software writer. But you don't need so many people writing the software. If you look at, a, let's say, some accounting software by Intuit. Intuit's a manufacturer of tax preparation software. There used to be maybe, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of tax accountants around the, around the place. And Intuit came along and wrote their own tax software, and the leaders, the founders of Intuit, became very rich indeed. But you don't need the same hundreds of thousands of people to be doing that. So there's many fewer jobs available by this winner-takes-all dynamic. So I'm saying here perhaps less than 25%. This guy here, Larry Page, who is the CEO and founder of a Google, says that probably maybe 90% of the jobs that people are doing, uh, that, that they're really not, no point in doing them soon. It'd be much, he says, wouldn't the world be a happier place if 90% of the people with jobs put their feet up instead and left the robots to do their work? This is in an interview in the Financial Times late last year. It's worth looking at a few more things he said. He said, same as I've just said, that rapid improvements in artificial intelligence, for instance, will make computers and robots adept at most jobs. Given the chance to give up work, nine out of 10 people wouldn't want to be doing what they're doing today. And would they regret losing their jobs? And he says, you know, might, this can't be the right answer, just people wanting to get work, even if it's inefficient, even if it's uh, just to keep themselves earning. This can't be the right answer. That brings us back to, well, what is that right answer? How can we distribute sufficient income resources from the abundance that these robots will be creating, from all the things that they'll be doing. Surely we should find a way to distribute that to everyone in society. And that brings us to the very last slide. I do think that as well as embracing some of this technological possibility, as well as steering it, we need to work very hard on developing a new social contract. Some people call it UBI, Universal Basic Income, which means that uh, people will get enough to have a, a good life, regardless of whether or not they are courts working or not. I don't think we're gonna get there straight away. I saw that only one political party made a serious discussion of UBI in the latest election, the Green Party, and they were sort of taken to bits by aggressive uh, interviewing, because they couldn't really explain how they're going to achieve it step by step, and so they stopped talking about it for this election cycle. I don't think this is gonna come in overnight, but it can be achieved in stages, Many transitional details need to be worked out. But I say, let's put our brains into working that out. Let's have a grand Apollo-scale project. An Apollo-scale project such as it was used to unite lots of effort to put a man on the moon and bring him back in the 1960s. We had an Apollo-scale project in this country in the 1940s, the second half, when we put the National Health Service in place, a grand social reorganization we need to work on the similar details to transition to something similar for everyone. And it's not just a change in law, it's a change in zeitgeist, a change in mindset, a change in values that's needed. Because today when you start discussing this, most people say, you know, we can't give people what money for doing nothing. They're just gonna be lazy. They should be pitied. They should be, they're undeserving. But I think there's so much evidence against this now that we understand more about the brain, now that we understand more about the psychology, there's lots of evidence that uh, people actually can do great things 
with, uh, with the help of a, a income support. And look at J.K. Rowling, who was on a child benefit as she wrote Harry Potter. That may or may not be your idea of the best books ever, but it shows and uh, what can be done. So I think more and more of us will be in this situation. And I see finally that the requirement for employment, which many people have dearly wanted to have, more and people have long thought for employment. I say this applies only in the initial phase of humanity. I'm looking forward to something called Humanity Plus. Humanity Plus, in which we don't need to work, in which the fruits of robotic uh, work, the fruits of energy from the sun, the fruits of green technology will be able to be distributed to everybody. The best is ahead, but we've got a big social project to work on first. So if we can navigate safely, we'll get there. Change in zeitgeist, you are part of that project. Let's go there together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, we'll take a couple of questions. So, uh, any qu questions? Um, wait for Sarah to reach you with the mic. Okay. Oh. Um, how long do you reckon it will take before um, politicians start to realise that the solution to unemployment is to create a society where not everyone needs to be employed and start pushing for this sort of thing more actively? So, I think it's like technology. It takes a long time seemingly going nowhere, and it doesn't seem that anything's happening, but then it will curve up exponentially. And the way to make that happen is that more and more people will start talking about it, more and more people will communicate in different ways. There's already great information about basic income. There's a book coming up in uh, next month, which I think is probably the best book on this subject yet, by somebody called Martin Ford, who covering many of the topics I've said in here. He's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur himself, but he's one who sees these issues. So, and there's great videos about this already by, uh, for example, uh, humans need not apply. So we need to keep working on this. We need to keep intelligently discussing. And sooner or later, some of them will get it. But it's going to take a lot of hard work. And uh, we should go through the disappointing and deceptive phase before we get to the disruptive phase. But I think that in five years' time, this has got to be much more on the agenda. Just one last comment on this. I was in a talk earlier this week by Adrian Waldridge, who is the writer in The Economist magazine on uh, business. And he said, quite candidly, in front of a big audience at the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, he said that the issues being discussed in this election were farcical, they were missing all the big issues, and he said the single biggest issue is technological unemployment. He said technological unemployment is going to, robots are going to give us 15 years of abundance followed by redundancy of jobs for everybody. So he gets it. And he's producing a new book as well, which I haven't bought yet, so I can't recommend or I'll say. So the message is starting to get there, but let's not be naive. Let's not say, think it's going to happen automatically. We each need to have this conversation with the people around us and to understand more fully. We also need to avoid overreaching and just saying, oh, we can turn the switch and automatically get there. There are lots of concerns about getting there, and we need to work out how we can do it stage by stage. But I think it's possible. Hello. Um, my question is regarding to the increasing gap we see between, and I agree with all the technological advances you for forecast for next, uh, you know, uh, decades, and I believe everyone here agrees that. But at the same time, we see that our society and the institutions that we have now in place have been created with values or, and structure of 19 centuries, and they become increasingly obsolete to what the future of society, uh, you know, waits for us. So my question to you is that how can we increase the dialogue and to bring up these questions to the current government structures in order to make this process towards the future available and of obviously um, you know an, um, like a an, uh, basic income is not just the end goal right we need to go further over that so if you can talk a bit about that thank you yeah I think you're entirely right the, the end goal is not basic income the end goal is everybody living a, a full human experience with all that they need which includes health care and education as well as the income how do we make this change, I think you're entirely right, it's to do with people's values. And often people have a strange set of values which they've inherited from the past. And we need just to be better at telling stories. Uh, some of this will be in Hollywood stories, and often, unfortunately, they, they tell them for entertainment values instead. But you know, it's easier and easier for people to make good videos. So I mean, Stephen over there has made some excellent videos on some of these topics uh, as well. Uh, we can uh, all do that. And by telling good stories, 
then we can change values. When in the past, for example, the technology of an an anesthetics, you know, when women were in pain in childbirth, people had the values that said, you know, well, we shouldn't be giving this. Because why? Because our values say it's wrong. Why? Because in the Bible, it says, you know, that a man and woman were sinful in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, God cursed the woman and said, you will suffer pain in childhood. And Queen Victoria, you know, she may not be everybody's idea of a hero, but she, after having about seven children herself, she heard about chloroform and she put her foot down and said, you know, I'm not going to have any more of this. And her advisor said, you know, uh, you know, when women are in pain, they cry out to God and it makes them have a wonderful religious experience. And Queen Victoria said, I'm not having any of that, thank you. <laughs> and uh, that was a change in values. And very fairly quickly that changed. I think there are many other things in values that will change, but it takes a while to get there and then something vivid happens that changes the population. And any more? Well, we've got time for one more question. Um, wait for Sarah to just sprint round to you. There you go, I sped her up. <laughs> thank you, hi. In climate change, there are best case and worst case scenarios for when um, the possible consequences are going to occur. Are there similar projections within the train of thought which you promote with respect to technological unemployment? So you mentioned 20 years. Uh, is there a case where inertia could make it 50 years or um, where something happens, a tipping point, and it happens a lot quicker? So this has not been analysed to anything like the same extent yet. All we can say is there are various scenarios. And I think most people who look at it have to say, we, we can't be sure to what extent will there be new jobs created. There probably will be new jobs created we haven't thought about. And to what extent are robots going to get better faster than we thought. So there's just a range of possibilities. But because we're unsure, it doesn't mean we don't do anything. You know, we're unsure when the climate change is going to kick in. And people have got some more ideas but it's still uncertain when there might be positive feedback of the methane gas escaping from the Siberian tundra. I mean, it might even be happening tomorrow, you know, that there's enough Siberian gas, uh, the Siberian tundra uh, melts and the huge amount of methane is released and suddenly the atmosphere cools uh, rapidly in the next 10 years. So we've got to prepare. So even though we don't know for sure when these things are going to play, we can say there is at least some probability that it's going to be happening quite quickly. There is some probability that more and more people are going to be angry and alienated. This is going to drive, I didn't say much about it, but it hooks in a lot to the inequality question because the people who are still in jobs are doing very well. The people who are not in jobs are increasingly poorer and it might drive a whole bunch of alienation and uh, angry people and some of it will be channeled in positive political fury and some of it will be channeled into, we might say, very destructive forces. And then we might have a reaction in terms of the government overreacting with a very strong policing, and we might go backwards uh, more quickly than we'd expected. So I want to avoid all of these violent outcomes. I want to do exactly what the Zeitgeist Movement says, which is to have a discussion about this along changing the train of thought and helping these ideas to become self-actualizing. Even though we don't know all the answers, we should have this discussion. <laughs>